From the field, to the film room, to the war room, we've got you covered every step of the way as the road to the draft starts right now on BGN Radio. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the BGN Draft Show. Today, we are going to be breaking down the top 10 edge rushers in the 2023 NFL Draft. And we all know how the Eagles like to build through the trenches. A lot of these guys are going to be in play for the Eagles at 10, maybe again at 30. There's guys all up and down the draft. This is one of the deepest positions at the draft, and I'm really excited to get into it. I'm joined today, as always, by Dibes. You can give him a follow on Twitter, at Mr. Crockpot. Be sure you check out his podcast, Party on Broad, where they do all kinds of draft content and stuff as well. Dibes, how excited are you to be talking edge rushers tonight? Super, super excited, Shane. Thanks for having me on. We broke down the cornerbacks last week, my number one position in the 2023 NFL Draft. Edge rusher is my number two. Uh, my top 10 is loaded with potential first-round picks. Lots to talk about tonight. All right, and I'm also joined by my host on Chalk Talk, You can or co-host on Chalk Talk. You can also check him out on the Tough Cover radio show. It is Mark Henry Jr. Give him a follow on Twitter at Mark Henry Jr. underscore Mark. How are you feeling this evening? I'm doing great. Uh, everyone, as everyone knows, uh, me and Dibes are big Sixers fans, and you're watching this on a little bit of a delay, but it seems to be a little bit of a chalk talk slash BGN uh, draft show tradition now that the Sixers play way too close of a game that ends exactly as we start the podcast. So if you see me, uh, wildly maniacally waving my arms at something that that's what's going on on delay you know what happened you know a couple days ago yeah i I am firmly of the opinion that there are no sports except football so uh, (laughs) i purposely do this to mark i just schedule podcasts during sixers games because basketball doesn't matter (laughs) and it's all about the philadelphia eagles and the nfl draft let's go he's trying to all right so let's dive into it here and since we're in a close game here uh, for the Sixers, and since we all have the same number one, uh, Mark, I'm going to let you lead us <laughs> off here with our universal number one. Uh, it is Will Anderson Jr., the edge rusher out of Alabama. Mark, take us away here. Honestly, like you could go on and on and on and on about this guy, and I'm going to let you guys do it. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the stats because it's comical. It's straight up comedy how good this guy was in the SEC. Um, obviously, 6'4", 243, he's got the measurables. He's got the athleticism, yada, yada, yada. I'll let Dives say all that. I'll let Shane talk about the RAS. I'll let you guys you know, go nuts. There's a lot to go nuts about with Will Anderson. But let's just talk about production on the field. He had a great 2022. 10 sacks, 17 tackles for loss, 51 tackles in 13 games. He also had a really good freshman 2020 arriving on the scene, making his presence known as an immediate contributor on the best team in the country. Seven sacks, 10 and a half tackles for loss, 52 tackles in 13 games. But the reason we're talking about him is 2021. And the reason that he's number one on a lot of draft boards, or at the very least top three on every draft board, He had 17 and a half sacks, 31 tackles for loss, 101 tackles in 15 games, and he had 82 pressures. That is, that's unheard of. We're talking about like guys lower on this list, like in my seven to 10 range, we're talking about guys who had 50 to 60 pressures over two years. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. Will Anderson had 82 of them in one year. You guys can continue on Will Anderson. (laughs) I, I, I just think that that is like unbelievable. And I remember during the season, I was making an argument that he should be absolutely taken seriously for Heisman because he was that unbelievably good in 2021. I don't think that'll ever happen. I don't think a defensive player will ever get the Heisman if he didn't do it in 2021 in a down year for the Heisman in 2021. So uh, I, I think Will Anderson is an absolutely beyond special talent. Uh, and, And there's a lot of players that you could comp him to. There's, you know, high-end comps, there's low-end comps. Uh, there's three that come to mind for me. And Hassan Reddick, in terms of the way he plays, he's a, he's bigger than Hassan Reddick, so he's almost like a, a supersized Hassan Reddick a, a little bit. Shaq Barrett is probably, and this might be, this might sound crazy because Shaq Barrett is, I mean, Shane can probably say better than I can, a top what defensive end in football is Shaq Barrett. Like, he's very good. He's in the yeah, top. Yeah, very good player top 15 that might be a low end 
comp for Will Anderson. And then the high end comp is prime Von Miller because he absolutely has that potential to be prime Von Miller. I I mean, any of those three great careers, great players, but if you're Denver Broncos, Super Bowl MVP Von Miller, like that's a, that's a special breed of talent that we don't see in the draft every year. And I I think Will Anderson has the potential to be that special. Yeah. His 207 career pressures in the last three years, that's 55 more than the next closest defender in that same time frame. His 37 sacks are 10 more than the next closest defender. Oh, and by the way, he did it all while having a 91.5 run defense grade from PFF, which trails only Aiden Hutchinson. So he's light. He's an exceptional run defender. He is a special, special pass rusher. Um, explosive first step. Uh, he converts speed to power well. Um, I You would not expect a guy at 253, 23rd percentile to be that good of a run defender, but he really is. Um, I... I don't. I, the only negative, I guess you could say, is I, I. I think he could use some more pass rush tools in his toolbox. He wins so much with that athleticism, and then converting speed to power. He's not super bendy, um, so offensive tackles will try to set wide and just force him to play through their frame. But it's nitpicking. Uh, he is an elite blue chip player. Uh, I when I do my draft grading. Um, he, he's one of two blue chip players that I have in this class. So he's a special talent and he, sh- there's no way if it weren't for quarter people reaching for quarterbacks, which is always going to happen. He's slam dunk the number one pick. So, all right. Uh, Dibes, do you have anything that you want to add in there on Will Anderson? No, I love the Von Miller comparison. That was my, uh, in my notes as well. Uh, he's number two on my big board. Just a versatile, highly athletic edge rusher, man. Uh, He has the versatility to line up in the 3, 4, or 5 technique. He can play anywhere in between the guard and the tackle. Uh, Outside the tackle, I think his size projects him best as a 3, 4 outside linebacker at the NFL level. Um, But if everything clicks, man, and it will, uh, this is the next, one of the surest things in this draft and the next superstar in the NFL from the 2023 NFL draft. Yeah, absolutely. I do think, like you said, his best fit is going to be as a stand-up rusher and like an odd front scheme, but you can kick him inside too. I don't think, I mean, it's not like he's going to fall very far, but I think his best fit is for kind of a three, four ish type of team more so than like a four, three DN. But if you were a four, three team, you just take him and you figure it out. You change your scheme. If you can draft Will Anderson jr. Because he's worth it. Yep. So, okay, so that is our number one. Uh, we're actually going to be the same all the way through our top four here. But our universal number two is Miles Murphy, a guy that I think we're all a little higher on than consensus. Consensus would have Tyree Wilson higher. Uh, consensus might have Lucas Van Ness higher, uh, some other guys. But Miles Murphy is a guy that we all really like, the edge rusher out of Clemson. Uh, he was a five star recruit. Uh, top 10 player nationally in his class. And as a freshman, he was an All-American at Clemson. Uh, he is 6'5", 268 pounds. Uh, he's only 21 years old, a very young 21. Uh, in 2022, he had 40 tackles, 11 tackles for loss, six and a half sacks, two passes defensed, and one forced fumble. I, I watch Murphy and I see a guy that's very strong and he's got elite athleticism. Uh, he explodes out of his stance. He times the snap well. He has all this, all the speed you need to threaten the edge. And he's also got good bend where I said that Will Anderson doesn't isn't the most bendy player. Miles Murphy has really good bend around the edge. So he can win with speed uh, and agility. He can also convert speed into power. And he will get you setting out wide. And then he drives into the tackle's chest and he can push the pocket. I also think he's got a nice little push-pull move. Uh, he's got a spin move that he likes to throw out there. So he's got a lot of tools in the tool chest uh, when it comes to pass rushing, which is a phrase you'll hear me say a lot on this podcast. But he's got the tools that you want there. As far as weaknesses go, uh, he's got tiny hands. He's got eight and a half inch hands, which is zeroth percentile. You remember last year when everybody talked about Kenny Pickett's hand size? Miles Murphy has the same size hands as Kenny Pickett. And... Yeah, he doesn't have to grip a football, but that is important for leverage and your grip strength on offensive tackles. 
I also think he's got a little bit of a false step at times. And so although he explodes out of his stance, sometimes he's got a little bit of a false step there that that robs him of that speed off the jump. And and then he struggles to finish. He only had six and a half sacks this year. I think he gets outmaneuvered in the pocket at times by uh, heads up quarterback guys with good footwork. And so something he's got to work on. But I think he's a scheme diverse guy. If you want to use him as a stand up edge rusher, if you want to put him in a three point stance, a four point stance, a wide nine, I think he can do a little bit of all of that. So I, I have a hard time as I think through rosters finding a team that Miles Murphy doesn't fit with. I think he's a great prospect. Dibes, what say you? Uh, just a toolsy prospect with a ton of athleticism, uh, with major, major bursts off the line, does most of his winning with raw strength and power. He's got to get coached up a tad at the next level, um, but he's got excel- elite acceleration capacity for his size, man. He's got uh, a- an unbelievable blend of elite athleticism, great edge contain, high-end pursuit, strong uh, tackling, that's actually one of my weaknesses. He did miss some tackles in 2022, but um, he d- just has all the hallmarks of someone who could possibly challenge for the de- defensive player of the year uh, down the line. Definitely raw, uh, but his floor is one that I, I feel safe saying that uh, he's uh, one of the best prospects in this draft. He's number four on my big board, well balanced in both run defense and as a pass rusher. Uh, if you watched any of my mock drafts, you'll see him pegged to the Eagles at number 10. Easily one of my favorite targets for the Philadelphia Eagles in the first round. All right. Uh, Mark, you were as high on Miles Murphy as anybody that I've ever heard talk about him as well. Uh, talk to me a little bit about him. What do you like so much about Murphy? Yeah, I mean, you guys touched on a lot of the stuff, but I, I just he just checks every box for me in terms of the versatility and how you can play him. I think Shane made a great point in terms of every roster and, and football needing him because you could use him in different ways. Um, I, I think he's going to be extremely scheme versatile. Um, and like I said, I think he just checks every box. You look at him, he was a five-star prospect coming out of high school. He's the number seven prospect in his class coming out of high school. The dude just turned 21. So there's still a lot of untapped potential that you can convince yourself to, to buy into. He was a three-year producer at Clemson a school that has churned out defensive line talent at this point. And he had the sack production. He had the run game production. And then you combine that with absolute freakish athleticism and freakish strength that he combines with, you know, a really, really high motor. Like this guy does not quit on plays. Like this guy has kind of, you know, he has a little bit of that dog mentality. He was a leader at Clemson on very good Clemson teams and extremely good Clemson defenses. I think there's a lot of people saying that he needs to develop more pass rush moves and add to his repertoire. And I feel like that, that you can say that about every pass rusher, but it seems like what he's doing at the age of 20 until he's turned 21 recently seemed like it was working just fine to me. Um, and I think he's only going to get stronger. I think he's only going to get better. He's only going to get more refined in terms of how he rushes the passer. Miles Murphy's my number three player overall. I, I absolutely love him as a prospect. I remember gushing about Miles Murphy during the uh, last college football season. Uh, so here we are, Mark. Yeah, it's it's been a long road with me and Miles Murphy, with you and Miles Murphy as well. We've been talking about him for a long, long time off air. Uh, I mean, he's been my dream Eagles target for a very long time. I mean, Will Anderson was at a certain point when we thought that Saints pick might be like number four or number five. But once yeah. we reali- you know, once we started to realize that that was probably not going to be a top five pick, I moved off of Will Anderson into Miles Murphy and my my Eagles dreams. All right, so that is our top two. Number three, we're also all the same. Uh, It is Tyree Wilson, the edge rusher out of Texas Tech. Uh, Dibes, I'll let you lead us off on Wilson. All right, Tyree Wilson, six foot six, two hundred seventy pounds, more crafty, more powerful than crafty. Uh, He's got long striding acceleration. Uh, He ranked number two in college football with forty-one quarterback pressures last year. Uh, One of my favorite prospects in this entire draft. Uh, He's got really strong hands, good power, motor, high-end pursuit, versatility. Uh, I think all of those check off the boxes to make him a three-down starter in the NFL. Uh, When you talk about negatives, I don't think he has the flash of a Will Anderson or a Miles Murphy. I don't think this guy's 
going to be able to to consistently burn by offensive tackles or pile up like 14 plus sack seasons we'll come back to this in like four or five years and could probably laugh at me uh making these crazy statements but his polish as a pass rusher is a little lacking uh he relies a lot on his rare physical tools to win pass rushes and uh you know we've seen him develop technically over time at texas tech but i'm not sure that he's developed technically long enough uh enough to win consistently at the nfl level i think this guy is a safe high floor edge rusher prospect that projects to be a an absolute force in the run game uh, and i'll let one of you guys talk about how dominant he is in run support because that's his bread and butter uh but tyree wilson my number five prospect in this draft all right mark i'll let you i'll let you talk a little bit about wilson and then i'll finish this off on him yeah, I mean, he's another guy who during the season last year, you just watch Texas Tech games and you go, who the heck's that guy? I mean, he sure. jumps off the screen, obviously, when you look at his size and speed and athleticism and everything he has. And he's got a quick first step while being able to bull rush you onto the ground and put you on your back. I mean, top four pressure rate among defenders in 2022. Um, and, you know, I've talked about this before, but he doesn't maybe he doesn't quite have the bend you're looking for. But you guys know me. I'm always willing to sacrifice that if you're, you know, six six with it with sack production, and you show traits that you're able to rush the passer. Um, but to be fair, the reason I have Murphy over him is I, I do think Murphy has a little bit more bend. Um, and I think that you know there raz- there's a razor thin margin there. I have Wilson as my number four overall prospect, where I have Murphy as three. Uh, my NFL comp, one of my favorite comps in this whole draft, is Chandler Jones. I, I think he's got a ton of Chandler Jones in him. It's a pretty direct size comp as well. Yeah, he's he's huge. 95th percentile for height. Um, like Dive said, he's got a quick first step off of the edge, but he doesn't have that bend to consistently threaten the edge. And I thought his best pass rushing reps came on twists or stunts or from reduced splits. Tech would kick him inside and he played well there. So um, he, he might, I don't know. I feel like he lacks a little bit of a true position. Like, is he an edge rusher? Are you going to kick him inside some? Like, I feel like in an odd front and like a three, four, you might want him as a DN, but in an even front, you might want him as a defensive tackle, a three technique, a four I uh, that might play a little more to his skill set. Um, he's got a really high floor because he's such a good run defender. He just, ha- he hasn't quite put it all together as a pass rusher, uh, but he's got this athleticism. He's got the size. He's got uh, power at the point of attack and he can drive guys back. I think ultimately whoever drafts Wilson, he's going to be a, he's going to be a a two down player for sure. Probably a three down player early in his career. Still, he gives you such a high floor as a run defender and you hope you figure out the pass rushing stuff. The downside to that is he's almost 23. So he is a little older for a guy that you're kind of drafting on athletic traits and size and considering him a work in progress. So uh, Wilson is going to hit if he hits, and if he doesn't hit, he's still going to be a top-level run defender. So he gives you a really high floor, and I think you can feel really comfortable taking this guy top 10. Yep. So. I agree. I, yeah, I think you feel comfortable taking him top five. Like, I, yeah. Yeah, I, have, I have number four overall. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's roll on to our number four. Again, all the same. I promise we didn't group think this. We're not watching film together. We just came to the same top four, but we start to diverge after this. Uh, it is Lucas Van Ness, the edge rusher out of Iowa. Dives, I'm going to let you lead us off on Van Ness. All right. Uh, six foot five, 275 uh, pound edge rusher here. His nickname is Hercules. Uh, this guy's name is Hercules. And let's talk about him. Uh, if you want to learn anything about Lucas Van Ness, all you got to do is turn on the tape of him overwhelming two of the nation's top offensive tackles in Peter Skaronsky and Paris Johnson Jr. last year. Uh, you know, watch this first, then go watch that, actually. Uh, but let's talk about Lucas Van Ness. He attacks off the edge like a grizzly bear. Uh, great body flexibility, powerful hands, elite length. Uh, I think he projects best as a two-down edge uh, who can, you know, have that versatility to play in a 3-4 or play in a 4-3 four, four, front. Um, I think whatever front he's playing in, but... Uh, I think he does best playing in a three-point stance. He looked quicker. He looked stronger as a defender with his hand in the dirt rather than standing upright. Uh, Negative-wise, he's a little unrefined as a pass rusher. 
Uh, he has he doesn't have a lot of coverage experience and he doesn't have that much bend. Uh, so I think that gives him the floor of like a high end backup with positional flexibility. Uh, projection is all about um, Lucas Van Ness is all about projection. And I, but I think the physical traits are there uh, for him to become a guy that can, you know, get eight to 10 sacks a season pretty quickly. Uh, it's just a matter of whether or not he can add more to his arsenal off the edge. Um, but I, I think this guy's also a force in the run game um, with an elite tool set and a project as a pass rusher. Uh, Lucas Van Ness, I have as a mid first round uh, selection and I like him a lot. Yeah. Uh, so he actually played, so he played interior defensive line for Iowa in 2021 and then he moved to edge in 2022. So a little bit of versatility there. Uh, he's 71st percentile height, 70th percentile weight. He had a 9.22 relative athletic score. He was only eighth percentile on the bench, which is why you got to watch the film because he's a powerful guy. I, I don't know, I don't know if his, I don't know if he cramped up or something on his bench at the combine, had a bad day, food poisoning, whatever. But he's stronger than that, um, so take that for what it's worth. He he's got a quick first step, I think, off the ball, and he uses it to start a bull rush. Like he's a bull in a china shop. He lands a heavy first punch and then he tries to forklift guys backwards. I got really powerful hands. Uh, like you said, he's a really good run defender, and he, he's rarely displaced from the line of scrimmage. Um, I think he's overly aggressive at times, and sometimes that comes at the expense of gap integrity. You'll see him pursue a play and get out of his gap and get, give a cutback lane, things like that. Um, he's also just raw. I mean, like I said, he was interior defensive line, then he kicked to edge this year, so he doesn't have a lot of reps in one spot, and he's never had high-end sack production. Doesn't have a lot of pass rush moves, but um, he's a guy that I think could do a lot of things for you. He's versatile. I think his best usage would be as a five technique, head up on the tackle, but he can take some reps outside, standing up, I think even. He could take some reps inside as well. He's a guy that you could move around. I don't think you want to do that early in his career, though. I do think you want to stick him in a place and leave him there and let him refine that technique. Uh, but later in his career, I do think he brings versatility to move all over the place. So that is uh, my thoughts on Van Ness. Mark, did you have anything that you want to add on Lucas Van Ness before we move on to number fives? Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of comps that people will make. George Karloff, this is an obvious comp that I think a lot of people will make. Um, it's, you know, <laughs> pretty obvious why, but white guy uh -huh. from the Big Ten. I think a lot of people will make that connection. But um, I, I don't think he has quite the power and brute strength that a Karloff has had. I, I would look at more of a Trey Hendrickson or, or maybe I, I even saw there's a direct RAS comparison with Ziggy Ansa, who actually I, I looked back and I, I didn't realize Ziggy Ansa had a really good couple first like four or five years of his NFL career, like 14 and a half sacks one year, 12 sacks one year. Um, so Ziggy Ansa might sound like not that great of a comparison, but um, I, he, he had a pretty successful NFL career once I looked at it and the size and speed were pretty exactly comparative uh, and there's an interesting guy that I have coming up at five who I think most people have way later in the second round who graded out really well in, in the combine um, but is for some reason going a lot later than this guy with pretty much the same package there's a tease all right. all right well we'll go ahead and get into our number fives here and Mark why don't you tell us uh, besides being a Notre Dame fan, why Isaiah Foskey is your number five edge rusher. <laughs> you, should, you should know, Shane. You, you have access to the RAS.football site, don't you, over there? <laughs> I do, I do. He's number eight for me. Uh, he is number seven for dives. You've got him at number five, so we'll let you lead us off on him. Well, he has, he's got the second highest RAS of any of these players in this entire position group at 9.58, 6'5", 264, extremely long arms at 34 34 inches, elite speed and agility, running a five, a four, five, eight with elite splits, 23 sacks over the last two years. It's not a fluke that he recorded one of the highest pressure to sack conversion rates in the entire country. 23 sacks on 65 pressures. He's an extremely smart pass rusher. He chooses his lanes very wisely. He's a three year starter. He was a captain, true edge setter, uh, beats up tight ends in the run game, good in the run game in general. His RAS comps are pretty incredible due to how well he tested out. If you go on there and take a look at some of the comparisons, 
Javon Kirsch, Jadavion Clowney, Bradley Chubb. Uh, it's pretty funny to see some of those names. And I'm not saying he's all the way that good. It's funny. The one that I had is not a size comp because he's actually, uh, I think, two or three inches bigger than this guy. Uh, but he's, he reminds me of a little bit of a taller, lankier Matthew Judon who really just broke out this year in New England. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of similarities there with Foskey. Um, I, I obviously got to watch Foskey a lot more than I got to watch a lot of these other guys watching every Notre Dame game. Um, and it's funny, going into the, his this year, you would have thought Foskey would have had a better year coming into sure. it. Um, and then you look at the production, still pretty good. I mean, what, 11 sacks or 12 sacks this year. Watching this year, he somehow felt not as impactful as 2021 even though the stats are relatively the same. Um, but in 2021, it felt like he was wrecking games a, a little bit more often than he did in 2022. And for all I know, that might just be the other team focusing a, a bit more on Foskey. Uh, but I think if Foskey would have taken a leap instead of kind of stayed stagnant, we could be talking about a guy who's a definite first round pick. Instead, it looks like he'll be, you know, probably a second round pick unless someone reaches on him at the back end of the first. Yeah, he's also kind of a special teams ace. Got four blocked punts in his career, yeah. and it's always helpful if, as a rookie, you can bring that to the table to get you on the field more. A uh, good tackler. He only missed one tackle all season. And he's got a nice long arm move. Uh, but he he got stonewalled by Paris Johnson and Dewan Jones, which are both guys we talked about in the offensive line uh, draft rankings podcast. So you can go check that one out if you missed it. Um, those are two really good guys. There's a lot more guys like that on the NFL level, though. I feel like he gets stuck on blocks a little more often than you like. Um, and as a front side run defender, he has a little bit of trouble dropping anchor, especially when he gets double teamed on the front side. On the back side, he's really good in pursuit. High motor player, relentless pursuit. But if you run at him, you can get some displacement, some movement. So like I said, he's eight on my big board. I like him. I don't have a first round grade on him. Uh, I think... Mark, I'm curious, uh, what what scheme do you think he projects best to? I kind of said that I thought he's a 4-3 D end or a 3-4 outside linebacker, or maybe some sort of a hybrid defense. Uh, I, I don't think you want to put him inside or even heads up on the offensive tackle very often, though. You want him outside. Um, so kind of a wide nine alignment or an edge and a 3-4 is kind of what I thought. Does that match what you think? Yeah, I kind of that's why I kind of compared him to Matthew Judon because you could kind of make the same argument with him where it's like you could play him at that 4 3 D end or that 3 4 outside linebacker. Um, I, I almost lean towards maybe outside linebacker, 3 4 outside linebacker. This is something interesting, Shane. I, I almost I, I don't know if this is a question or maybe this is something we, we can look into for a chalk talk episode, um, in the future. How many what do you think the percentage is at this point of teams that play? that four, three wide nine alignment compared to teams that play that three, four alignment where like, what's the more likely scenario that he lands in just based on the numbers. That's a good question. I could look that up. I could, I could chart that out and get back to you on it. Yeah. I'm I'll, curious. I'll do I, some homework this week. And a lot of defenses are so multiple now that mm. it, it seems like that it, you know, it, it's a little tougher probably than it was in the past to say this team is strictly this, this team is strictly that, but um, I, I think that's kind of one of the one of the pluses about Foskey is that you can probably sell yourself on him uh, pretty much whatever scheme you're running, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that is Isaiah Foskey. He is five for Mark, seven for Dives. He's number eight for me. Uh, Dives, let's talk about your number five. You have BJ Ojolari. He's my number six. He is Mark's number ten. Uh, why don't you take the floor and talk about him? All right. Uh, no one in the SEC had a better pass rush win rate than B.J. Ojolari, who missed a few games last year. Uh, a little bit undersized. Uh, that also shows up in the run game. But this is a guy with elite speed, elite dip as a pass rusher. Uh, he's a true finesse pass rusher at six foot three, 244 pounds, explosive athlete with good, good burst uh, at the snap of the ball. Uh, I think he strictly projects best as a designated pass rusher to start his career at the next level. Uh, he can rush from all over the defensive front. Um, uh, really good length, good flexibility, good technique. Uh, I think he can make an impact early on. And um, you like to kind of see him develop a little bit more uh, in coverage. Um, but I think this is a guy that 
uh, has a lot of upside at the next level, whether that's winning through power, winning through speed, uh, fighting his way through persistent blockers, man. I think uh, if it clicks, I think he definitely has three down starter potential uh, in the NFL. Uh, he clearly needs to work with, you know, NFL strength and conditioning coaches to kind of continue to build his, build his strength and kind of unlock his potential. Uh, but this is a guy that I have a round one through two grade on out of LSU, BJ Ojolari. Yeah, he was also given the number 19 jersey at LSU, which represents the team's captain and a guy with high character uh, for LSU. So that's a big deal. He's the brother uh, of New York Giants edge rusher Aziz Ojolari. So if the name sounds familiar, that's why. Um, he is small, 15th percentile height, 10th percentile weight. He is explosive. He had 92nd percentile broad jump. And he just he wins with speed. You got a lightning fast first step. He's very bendy. Uh, he's a fluid mover. All his te- he's very technically refined. And one thing he's really good at is he's good as the read player and read option plays because he's so athletic that he can sort of show one thing and then he can show the, taking the running back and then he can bounce to the quarterback. He can sort of knock both those guys out. Um so he's really good in that regard. He struggles mightily as a front side run defender. If you run at him, he will be nowhere to be found. He, he's got no power rushing ability and he really struggles to defend the run. So at this point, I think he's what you said. He's a pass rushing specialist. He's going to be a three, four edge rusher that comes in on passing downs. You're not going to have him on the field on first down or short yardage situations. And that's why he's a little lower on the board for me than I would have him higher just on his pass rushing potential, but that run defense is concerning for me. And there's some other guys that I would rather take that I can trust for all three downs. So Ojalari, he needs to bulk up a little bit. And I think that can happen at the next level. Uh, But for now you're getting a good pass rusher for two out of the three downs. Probably. I feel like Shane made my argument for why he's 10 (laughs) for me in terms of the three down argument in terms of the run game. Yeah. I just don't think he'll ever be a three down player. And you guys know, I often struggle with those types of guys that are so specific. And I think you're putting yourself in a situation where if you're drafting Ojolari, he has to be so elite as a pass rusher to justify that pick. I don't know if I'm there because of the size, because of the lack of being a power rusher, um, and because of the lack of being able to be on the field when they run the ball. Because I think he's very much a liability in, in terms of that sense. And Aziz Ojolari's turned into a nice player. It, it wasn't right away. Like, he, he took a little bit. He's a bit of a tweener. BJ's kind of the same way. And my seven through nine, I, I had Ojolari kind of close to those guys. And I still do have him relatively close to those guys. But you'll see my next couple of players, I, I think you can make an argument that they have a path to playing three downs yeah all right let's go on to my number five uh, who is number six for both dives and mark it is nolan smith the edge rusher out of georgia uh, smith was a five-star prospect the top overall player in his high school class he is a four-year contributor at georgia uh, he did tear a pectoral muscle in 2022, and that ended his season after eight games. So he's coming off of that injury. He is 6'2", which is 15th percentile, 238 pounds, which is second percentile. So he is small, uh, just over 22 years old. He ran a 43940, which is 99th percentile with a 41 and a half inch vertical, 98th percentile. He has a 9.21 relative athletic score. So super athletic. Now, 18 tackles, seven tackles for loss, three sacks, and one pass defensed in eight games. Uh, his highest sack total in a season was four and a half in 2021. So he has not been a high sack player. But you watch him play, and he explodes off the line at, to threaten upfield at the snap. And he has ridiculous bend. He's able to dip under offensive tackles regularly when they try to punch, and he gets to the quarterback. Uh, he's despite his size, he's a strong edge setter in the running game, and he's really good at using his athleticism to string plays out to the sideline and make plays. And I would say he's a very good tackler. And similarly to what I said with his, uh, BJ Ojolari, he negates the read option really well with his athleticism, but he's undersized at the position and he can be stonewalled 
when he's facing athletic tackles who have the ability to run him around the horn. He, he doesn't really have power moves to get around that. So he doesn't have much in the way of counter moves if he can't bend around the edge or just push you backwards. So he needs some more tools in the toolkit, but he's highly athletic. He kind of flew up draft boards at the combine when he ran his 40 and he did his vertical jump and all those sorts of things. Uh, he's the guy you want playing wide in space, a wide nine defensive end, a three, four stand up rusher. Uh, but Nolan Smith, I think he's going to go in the first round. I think there's some refinement needed in his game, uh, but I have a hard time not betting on athletes that are so explosive. So that's why he's number five for me. Uh, Dibes, you got him at number six. Uh, what do you like about Nolan Smith? I mean, you, I don't know if you touched on the combine, but just ridiculous measurables, man. 439, 40-yard dash. That's faster than Saquon Barkley, DeAndre Hopkins, and Stephon Diggs. He had a 41-and-a-half-inch vertical. Um, just elite measurables, man. Um, so um, let's talk about him just being super raw you know it, it the question is can he be a three down starter uh you know on the first day of the first time he wears an nfl jersey i don't think so um i i think he projects best as a starting outside linebacker in a three four um and i think he's a little bit quicker out of a two-point stance um i i but i don't think he's limited to a three four i think he could eventually uh, play in the three-point stance as in a 4-3 edge down the line. But right now, he's not anywhere close to being a finished project. Uh, this guy is uh, all about projection, projection, projection. Um, and I think, uh, like Shane said, like his ceiling rests on whether or not he can develop more of a pass rushing arsenal. But if he can, I mean, you're talking about a 10-plus sack guy uh, every year in Nolan Smith. Uh, I've got a round one through two grade on this guy and uh wow what a combine he he uh he had there a few weeks ago yeah all right mark anything that you want to add on nolan smith my nfl comparison for nolan smith is deandre hopkins playing defensive end <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, when madden ultimate team does the out of position players every year we got deandre hopkins at d end here yeah, and I've dropped the ball on a couple NFL comps throughout here, so let me just sprinkle in a couple that I didn't mention. Um, I guess it's only just one. It's uh, that it, Miles Murphy. I didn't mention his, and it's I think he's got a little Bradley Chubb, a little Montez Sweat. So I wanted to throw that out there. Um, I, I thought that I forgot more than that, but I'm, I'm happy that I that I hit the other ones. Yeah, the only one that I have for Nolan Smith is DeAndre Hopkins to DN because I truly don't know what you can compare Nolan Smith to. He's like a unicorn level prospect in terms of his speed and athleticism. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see. I mean, he's the prototypical guy to skyrocket and end up going like 12th, right? It feels like we're we're going to end up there by draft day. I like it. Yeah, it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's so funny. Like I, people ask about how are these guys so much, you know, faster now we're getting, you know, a defensive end running a four, three, nine, 40 and things like that. But you gotta remember Nolan Smith is 238 pounds. Like in, in another era, there's no way that he, he couldn't have done it. He would have been playing like safety at that size. If you go look up, like, I don't know, like how, how big, what, what it was Mike Vrabel. I don't uh, Any idea? I, he was probably like six two. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna. I'm actually gonna pull it up now. Mike Vrabel was 270 pounds playing linebacker, and now we've got <laughs> Nolan Smith at 238. Like it, they're not. It's just the way football has changed. It's all about getting lighter. It's all about getting faster. So that's why you see all these combine, just phenomenal performances. It's almost like. It's almost like when you look at these relative athletic scores, if it's not over a nine, it's not impressive because everyone's just so athletic now because the the players are just getting smaller and they're training better and they're faster. And it's all at the expense of something. It's at the expense of power, things like that. But so much fun to watch these guys and their explosiveness. As we are through the top six, let's kick it off with the number seven player on our board. Uh, for Mark and I, it is the same guy. It's Keon White. Uh, he is number eight for dives, the edge rusher out of Georgia Tech. Mark, why don't you lead us off with Keon White? Yeah, Keon White is a guy who it's kind of funny. Like, I, I don't think I, I, I guess I just missed him. Whatever I did in my first go around in my 
kind of when I was collecting my notes early on in December and January. Not that I don't do my scouting during the college football season. As you guys know, I gamble on about 10 college football games every Saturday. So I'm doing my scouting in my own weird ways during the college football season. And Keon White, I guess I'm not watching a lot of Georgia Tech. He slipped through the cracks a little bit throughout the year. And I remember I, I pulled up a mock at one point. I don't know who it was. I don't want to give him any free publicity anyway, um, since we're the true experts when it comes to this. I mean, that's why you're here 42 minutes in. But uh, uh, Keon White was popping up in the top 15 all of a sudden. And I, I texted Dives and, and Shane and said, who the heck's this Keon White character? <laughs> and and it, it seems like he has risen. Um, and it, it's calmed down though it, it, over the last couple months and since I first kind of saw him rising up that board. But it's easy to understand why he'd rise. I mean, this is a guy. You look at the fact that Trav- Trayvon Walker went number one last year, and it's because of traits like Keon White has, to be quite honest. And uh, Keon White's six five two eighty five, extremely long arms at thirty four. Excellent vertical and broad jump. Insane combination of speed, size, and athleticism. It feels like he somehow has the traits of a guy who could play inside. He could play T end. He could even like potentially like stand up and play outside linebacker. Like I just think he has that athleticism to be that versatile. Um, he can even drop back a little bit when he's been asked to on tape. He's extremely raw. I mean, this is still a recent tight end convert to edge rusher. Um, he went to Old Dominion, was a tight end. He switched to edge rusher, took a year off. Then he went to Georgia Tech. So it's a bit of a bit of a circuitous route to the NFL here for for uh, for Keon White. But here he is, and he even while being an incredibly raw edge rusher, he had seven sacks and thirty pressures in 2022 with a 72.6 pff grade there's a lot of things he just doesn't have a feel for yet and you you hope you get him in a system that he can acquire that the the, you know i don't even have a comp for him yet because i don't know if we know who or what he's going to be or what role he's going to fill so i think so much of that is still ahead of him if you're taking him you're just betting on his absurd traits you're willing for it to be a little bit of a project you're not looking for instant success, I don't think, unless you guys think he's a little bit more NFL ready than I do. I think it is a little bit of a project. I think you're you're betting on a long-term vision with him. There's some concerns with that, though, because he is 24. So yeah. are you willing to take a 24-year-old uh, who's very raw with a little bit of a question mark on where you're going to play him? That's the question. But I, I say all that. It makes it sound like I'm low on the guy. His traits are just so absurdly good. Like, like I said, he's extremely comparable to Trayvon Walker. Like you look at some of the traits and some of the size stuff, some of the athleticism stuff, there's some similarities there. That guy went first. So like that, that's the kind of traits. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about when it comes to Keon Wood. Yeah. I mean, he's a freak athlete. He's huge, fast, explosive, 89th percentile bench, 91st percentile weight. Um, He's got a high motor. He, he's he was a captain in 2022 for Georgia Tech. So I mean, he's a high character guy. Lives football. He's just raw. 2022 is the first time he was a full time starter at defensive end at the collegiate level. So you see that on film. Uh, he's got a powerful punch, but he's got poor timing with it. A lot of times he allows offensive linemen to engage him first and get into his chest. Uh, he tends to shed blocks to the inside which is problematic when you're an edge rusher that's supposed to set the edge. And so he gives up that edge. Uh, He's a little bit of a tweener. I don't know. Should he play inside or outside? There's a lot of things to work out with Keon White. And I don't remember who I said this for earlier, but same sort of thing that I think he can do a lot of things for you, but you have to give him a narrow focus early on and let him refine that one thing. You got to walk before you can fly. So or walk before you can run, whatever that dumb saying is. That's what Keon White needs to do. You need to give him some sort of focus. You got to have a plan for this guy. The tools are there. The potential is sky high. But I do think it's going to be a process because when you get to the NFL level, everybody's a freak athlete. And so you can't just win with that. Uh, He needs to go a place that he's going to have some stability and some good positional coaching. And I really do think he could be a really good player in year two, three, and beyond. I'd hope that it's walk before you can run. I mean, if you're drafting him, expecting him to fly, that feels a little unfair. I mean, he's just a football player, Shane. I mean, he is a freak athlete, so maybe <laughs> he could do it. He was clocked at 21 miles per hour. If he just stretches out those gigantor arms, he can't be that far from flying, right? That's fair. That's fair. 
<laughs> be great at right. Quidditch is what we're saying. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Be, he'd be an excellent seeker. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dives, you also have, you know, you have Keon White eight. So you've got him a slot below us. Um, what are we missing on White? Uh, fill in the gaps for us. Um, it, this guy was is, is arguably the, one of the biggest winners of the draft process. Dominated at the Senior Bowl. Um, his you guys really crushed it. Great athleticism, great versatility inside or out, um, and just a ton of untapped potential. However, like Mark said, that was this is the biggest one in my notes. He's 24 years old already. Uh, so just such a raw, unrefined pass rusher. I, I think. Uh, like Shane said, it's going to be not about year one, but more so year two, three, or four uh, when it comes to Keon White. But um, he's a really exciting prospect, and I, I think he has a really legit chance of you know, being in the back end of round one for sure. All right. Let's roll on to uh, the only number eight we haven't revealed yet is Mark's. Uh, it is Derek Hall, uh, edge rusher out of Auburn. He is not on the list for Dibes and I. Uh, full disclosure, he's number 13 for me. So he's there. I watched him. He was fun watch. But Mark, uh, tell us about Derek Hall. Yeah, this is a guy I've really kind of fallen in love with through the process. I'm going to have this guy, I, I mean, in my in my top 45, in my top 50. This is a guy that I have a really solid second round grade on. 6'3", 254, former three-sport athlete who also starred in basketball and track. Uh, he was a four-star prospect. I'm going to go deep here since you guys disrespected him and didn't put him <laughs> on the list. I'm going to give Derek Hall his respect here at number eight on my list. And again, you, you know, Shane Half, he acts like he's this RAS guy. He acts like he loves the, the relative athletic score. Derek Hall, great RAS, 9.24 RAS, elite in the 40 at 4.55, elite in the 10 and 20-yard dash, elite in the broad jump, elite in the vertical, incredibly long arms. Has tremendous power to bull rush with an, on, on top of that obvious speed that I just brought up. He converts speed to power to drag a tackle to the ground. He uses his length to punch the chest, put them on their heels. Four-year contributor, three-year starter at the highest level in the SEC. PFF grades of 64.4, 76.6, and 71.3 in his three seasons starting. I don't think those accurately depict how good he was at Auburn on a defense that didn't have a lot of pros on it, especially up front. He really broke out in terms of sack production over the last two years. 18 sacks over the last two years with 53 hurries, 74 hurries over the last three years, 280-plus pass rushing grades over the last two years. Deadly first step. He gets on you quick, sideline to sideline speed. Uh, total gamer, never quits on a play. He was a team captain in 2022. Uh, solid against the run, but it seems like he's got the traits to be even better at that. Like, I, I think that, you know, you put him in the right system. I think he could improve as a run defender. Um, he's not going to provide much in the way of bouncing inside or being versatile in, in, in the interior, uh, but he should be able to handle any role outside of the tackles. You could look at that positively or negatively. You could either say he lacks versatility or you could say he has a defined role and kind of knows exactly what he is and what role he plays. I kind of choose to look at it that second way. I think he's a guy who can fit in a role right away at the NFL. Like, I actually think he's a guy who could play pretty fast. Um, I, I don't think that there's going to be a long runway to get this guy ready to get on the field. He's got a lot of experience in the SEC, and he had pretty good sack production, got a pretty good feel for rushing the passer. Um, I think he's the type of guy who could play pretty fast. And this is a pretty good projection because I think a lot of the times I go way high or I even go low on a guy I don't like. This is kind of swinging right there for a single. Carl Lawson, very solid pass rusher, really similar athletically, plays for the Jets. He was really solid on the Bengals for a couple of years there. That's one of my favorite comps I've made in my entire top 60. All right. Yeah. So I, I have Hall at 13, um, explosive athlete, like you said. Uh, and I think he's really good in the run game. My, my problem with him as a pass rusher is he's got that explosive first step. He's got speed, but he can't really bend around the edge very well. And so he... His go-to move is speed to power. That's really his only pass rush yeah. move. I want to see him develop more there, which that comes at the NFL level. But where I saw him have trouble was against like athletic tackles when they would jump set at him to avoid him building up that head of steam. It, they tended to kind of stonewall him. So uh, he's good at what he's good at. I, he needs to branch out a little bit. But I, I like. I think I've got a second round grade on Hall, or I might have an early third. I can't remember. I'd have to look that up. But 
Uh, he's a guy that I expect to go on day two. And like you said, I think he's going to contribute early somewhere and hopefully he can build out that repertoire a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's definitely, he's definitely got stuff to improve on and he's not a finished product, but it, I think that he's also a guy who it's not, it's not like it's a project. Like it's not like you're drafting him, hoping that he turns into a player two years from now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dibes, anything you want to tell Mark that Derek Hall stinks at before we move on to number nine? No, he's in my top hundred. I have a day two grade on Derek Hall. Uh, I think he's better against the run than he is as a pass rusher. He needs to develop his arsenal a little bit. Um, but he wins with great strength, great upper body strength. And uh, I thought he tested way better than I expected. Uh, at, and he looked really good at the Senior Bowl. So uh, Derek Hall. I looked it up. I've got a third round grade on him. I've got him in the third. So, all right. Let's roll on to our number nines here. Yeah. Uh, Dives and I both have Will McDonald the fourth as our number nine. Uh, Dives, why don't you lead us off with Will McDonald? Oh, man. Just again, I I probably overrate the Senior Bowl, but I don't care. Here we are. Uh, but he was one of the winners of the Senior Bowl. Looked absolutely dominant. Um, made Darnell Wright, who is currently getting first round uh, buzz as an offensive tackle, look absolutely silly. Uh, at the combine, had a broad jump of 11 feet and a 36 inch vertical. Uh, that broad jump tied for best among defensive ends at this year's combine. Uh, uh, he was that was third best uh, among defensive ends at the combine overall since 2009. Uh, he already possesses a legit move set. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter and just look up some of those highlights, one of the most amazing spin moves uh, you'll ever see just makes offensive linemen look super silly. Um, uh, you look at this guy, man, I think he's going to be, he's right now one of my favorite day two targets uh, for the Philadelphia Eagles. I think schematically he'll line up best as a stand up outside linebacker, not fronts. Uh, he'll probably be a third down pass rusher to start his NFL career from day one uh, because he needs a lot of work as a run defender. Uh, he isn't big enough. He isn't strong enough to hold up at the point of attack uh, at the NFL right now. Um, and he might even struggle against bigger tight ends uh, initially. But I do think this guy has the athleticism to really develop in coverage. And uh, he's going to also need to bulk up and develop into a kind of if he wants to develop into a three down uh, defensive lineman. But Will McDonald um, is really intriguing. And I've kind of I've the more I've watched him or the more I've watched Will McDonald, the more I've kind of been uh, come away more and more impressed. Yeah. Also, the more I watch Will McDonald, the more upset I get with Iowa State, because the way that they used him in 2022 was malpractice. In 2020 and 2021, he had double-digit sacks. He was first-team All-Big 12 in 2021. In 2022, they put him more playing like 4-I, inside shade on the tackle, and his production dropped. He only had five sacks, uh, seven and a half tackles for loss. And that's just a chronic misuse of a guy that's 239 pounds, third percentile weight for defensive end. And instead of getting him out in space where he can use his length, 90th percentile arms, he's got the he's explosive. Instead of getting him out in space, they kicked him inside, and I just don't understand why. Uh, he's so explosive off the edge. His spin move is so good. He's got good hand counters, and even though you mentioned it, he's got not a very good ability to anchor against the run, which, again, don't kick him inside. <laughs> he does a good job of like keeping his eyes in the backfield and knowing where the ball is going, and he uses his long arms to swipe at ball carriers, even though he struggles to get off those blocks. Um I wrote down in my scouting report, if he's on the field on rundowns in the NFL, he needs to be outside the tackle to avoid any sort of double teams. And Iowa State just didn't put him in those positions. They put him in positions to fail, I thought. And I, I was very upset about it, as you might be able to tell. Uh, also, he doesn't he can't rush with power. And again, you don't put a guy that can't rush with power inside. So I think he's a 3-4 stand-up edge rusher. A sub-package pass rush specialist early on. And I think he's going to excel in that role. He's not a three down player. And so that's why he's a little lower, but just for a guy that's going to rush the passer, uh, I think McDonald's a really exciting watch. And I think he's going to make an early impact for a team. I say it all the time. We've got types on this show. 
<laughs> and uh, and you know you heard why I don't like Ojolari, and I feel like you can kind of copy paste the reasons for McDonald. And by the way, don't like Ojolari. I have a second round grade, and I also have a second round grade on McDonald. So um, these are not guys that I'm out on by any sense of the imagination. It's just comparatively in a very deep class. Um, why I have concerns and why I put them behind guys like Smith, White, Hall, and uh, Felix and Aduke um, based on some of the three down potential that those guys have that I don't think McDonald has based on him being so small and being undersized and not being any, I don't think he's going to be a good run defender at any level. Um, the, the thing that strikes me with Will McDonald is the fact that I think you can lock in the fact that he's a Seattle Seahawk if they don't take a defensive end at number five. He <laughs> like projects as everything P. Carroll loves in, in his uh, outside linebackers, just getting a you know a bendy kind of guy. He, he reminds me a lot of Bruce Irvin, who they kind of famously took at like sixteen, and people had like a third round grade on Bruce Irvin. He turned out to be like a like a pretty good pro. Like I don't think he turned out to be great or anything, but it wasn't like a bust either. Um, they've drafted a lot of guys like that and they've played a lot of guys like that through the years. Seems like a perfect scheme fit for Pete Carroll um, and Seattle. And I could see them taking him at 20 if they don't take an edge rusher at number five. All right. Well, let's move on to Mark's number nine. Uh, Mark's number nine is Felix and Yuduke Yazoma from Kansas State. Mark, he's nine number 10. He's your number nine. He's outside of dives top 10. So you can lead us off here. Tell us what you like about him. Yeah, he's definitely a guy who uh, has kind of risen for me throughout the process, just watching film and watching some of some of his tape. And he's super bendy and twitchy. Yeah, I mean, he's just like kind of looks like a first round pick when you, you just turn him on and you look at him in the in the uniform. It's like, oh, he looks like he could just play in the NFL today in terms of athletically and in terms of the, the physical profile. Uh, 6'3", 255, long arms at 33 and a half inches, you know, jacked. Like I said, two-year starter with PFF grades of 85.4 and 74.6. 21 sacks over the last two years with 54 pressures. He gets underneath the pads of the tackle really, really well. Uh, they've tried to use him inside at times. He's not good at it. Um, he's definitely a guy who should be lining up off tackle. Uh, not very versatile, kind of similar to how I laid out with Derek Hall. Not a guy you're going to bounce inside. You kind of know exactly what you're drafting wh when you're drafting this guy. And I think that that's a positive, not a negative. You know exactly what you're getting. It's not a question mark. Um, he, he's, he can handle a three-down workload. He, he's a good, in the, good against the pass, good against the run. And he just turned 21 years old. So there's a lot of upside. There's a lot to tap into here um, with, can, should we call him FAU? Felix Anaduke. I mean, it doesn't really work. Like Jeremiah Usu Koromoa, it was so easy to just go JOK. FAU, I mean, that's like, that's a college. Florida Atlantic, they're still alive in the Sweet 16. But uh, yeah, I, I think that he's going to be a really solid player. And another guy, just like Derek Hall, uh, I think this is another guy who could step in and play pretty fast. Like I think this is a guy who could at least by his second year, be expected to take a, a really large percentage of snaps. Yeah, he's got a lot of tools in the toolbox as a pass rusher as well. He's got a Euro step, a spin move, a rip move, a two-handed punch. He's got a lot of moves, which is good. You don't often see guys coming out with that many moves that they've kind of perfected. So he's really good at that. Um, he can set the edge sometimes in the run game. Other times he lets O lineman get into his chest and then he can't shed blocks. He doesn't have the strength to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the biggest negative I saw with him is he doesn't play on balance. He's kind of got like a frenetic play style. And so he ends up on the ground a lot more often than you would like when, when his moves don't work. But I, I really liked him. I, I think he's a good player. And like you said, I think he's got a pretty clearly defined role. He's not one of these guys you take and you've got to be like, we've got to have a plan for him to figure him out. You pretty much know what he is. And, Sometimes there's comfort in that. Yeah, I, I think he's very Dante Fowler-ish. And he's a guy who's kind of went around to a couple teams because he's very defined role. Like, you know exactly what you're picking up when you're picking up Dante Fowler to fit a role. All right. And that brings us to the last player to reveal here. It is Dibes' number 10 player. It is Adi Tamiwa Adabare from Northwestern. And Dibes, I will Venmo you $5 if you can spell his name without looking at it right now. Uh, I will just give you the money right now because <laughs> absolutely not. Um, this is a guy with elite versatility, man. Can play inside, can play outside. Clocked an official 4 4 9 40 yard dash at the combine. 
uh, which is really crazy when you think about this guy. Probably could have worked out with the interior defensive lineman at the combine. Uh, crazy measurables, 37 and a half inch vertical leap. That was third among all edge rushers. 10-5 broad jump tied for fifth. That broad jump was even better than Trayvon Walker's mark from last year, despite being 10 pounds heavier. Um, he's six foot two, 200, 282 pounds. Uh, other guys with that level of si with that size and that level of explosiveness, you're looking at JJ Watt and Mario Williams. I think he's a hybrid defensive lineman uh, in the NFL. Uh, against the run is kind of uh, Adebayo's like bread and butter. Uh, he's physical and strong at the point of attack. Uh, he refuses to get blocked by tight ends. Uh, Northwestern used him in various fronts, which I think will excite a lot of NFL teams uh, at the next level. I think this guy is an immediate plug and play run defender and has potential to develop some more pass rushing moves. Uh, and you got to be excited with that athletic profile. So uh, I, he's probably a tweener. Um, I don't really know if he should be inside or out, um, but I think his elite athleticism gives him a ridiculously high floor. Uh, I have him a, as a day two guy, but I think he could absolutely uh, squeeze into the end of back end of day one. Yeah, he they Northwestern used him as a anywhere from like a three technique to a five technique. So they moved him around a little bit. I'm with you. I think he's a little bit of a tweener. 9.85 relative athletic score. He's fourth percentile height, but 87th percentile weight. Uh, I'm not sure he's got the flexibility or the length to be an edge rusher. Not sure if he's got the anchor to to sustain playing inside. I put down for the scheme fit. This is the only guy I got this specific on, but I said that his scheme fit is a 4-3 team that likes to use NASCAR packages. Like, that'd be perfect for him. Put him on the edge a little bit in your 4-3. Kick him inside on pass rushing downs. Uh, I think that's a good on-ramp for Adebora. He was my number 11 guy, so he just missed being in my top 10. Uh I may or may not have bumped him to 11, so I didn't have to try to say his name live on air, but you run that for me, so thanks for that. No problem. All right, well, that rounds out our top 10 edge rushers. Uh, very deep class. There's always honorable mention, mention guys that we like that we didn't get the chance to get into our top 10 that we want to give a shout out to. Uh, Mark, I'll, I'll throw to you first here. Who's a guy that you watched or a couple guys you watched that you liked, you just couldn't get him into your top 10? There's one guy that I really want to get to, but one guy that's not that close to my top 10. He's probably more like 14, but no, I don't think he's going to get mentioned in a lot of these videos. And I, I actually, I, I've kind of started to really like this guy. Another guy, I don't know if he's inside or outside. Mike Morris from Michigan, not a guy you'll hear a lot about. He had 84 PFF grade in 2022, um, nine sacks last year, 21 hurries. He's 6'6". Six, six. Graded out really well in terms of his RAS. He brutalized Paris Johnson um, mm -hmm. in the Michigan Ohio State game. He had uh, Paris Johnson kind of, kind of, you know, on his heels, really uh, bull rushing him, going around him, kind of switching up what he was going to do on a game by game basis. He had an 86.8 pass rushing grade, one of the best among the class. Um, I, I think Mike Morris has the potential to to really, really make an impact at the next level. Um, it depends what he is. He's a little bit of a tweener. It'll be interesting to see what he turns into. He's a guy I would not mind taking a swing on once you he, once you reach around round three. All right. Oh, and that, uh, my my bad. I didn't even. I, I totally buried the lead there because uh, I was I was mentioning him as like a throwaway guy. That's my bad. That was terrible podcasting by me. But Andre Carter is the guy that I really wanted to mention, and it's a shame because I mean, if we did this like two months ago, Andre Carter is number six or number seven for me on this list. But it has been a brutal draft process for Andre Carter. Graded out poorly at the combine, was terrible at the at the uh, at the Senior Bowl. And that's something I'll maybe I'll let I'll, I'll let Dives talk on that a little bit more. I know he pays a lot of attention to the Senior Bowl, and he might have been the biggest story from the Senior Bowl, and in terms of a negative, not a positive. It's not often you'll hear that, but I mean, this is a guy who was pretty elite at the college level at Army. I mean, Army obviously plays a little bit of a different scheme, but in 2021, he had 15 sacks, 35 pressures, 
really took a step back in 2022 in terms of production with only four sacks and 17 hurries. Um, he, he has a pretty defined role in terms of what he did in college with pretty much lining up only outside tackle. Um, we're talking about a guy who's six, seven, like that alone makes him a, a pretty interesting prospect, but he is just not strong like at all. He needs to put on some strength. He needs to put on some muscle. Uh, maybe you have him as a, a bit of a three, four outside linebacker. I, he hasn't really done that. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see what you use Andre Carter as. There's part of me that says he just bet on it since he was able to get to the passer at such a high rate in college, ND 6-7, but clearly he didn't make my top 10. So um, I'm not betting on it that hard. Yeah, he was – he was so he was a wide receiver slash tight end in high school. So he's relatively new to the defensive side of the football uh, 96th percentile height, only 30th percentile weight, 0th percentile bench. And he just, you meant he's slight frame and he lacks functional strength. And a lot of it is due to weight restrictions at Army that they don't train the same way that other colleges do. That's why they run different schemes with different athletes because, I mean, let's be honest, you can't be 280 pounds knocking out 38 reps on the bench and be in the shape that the Army needs you in. And so I think he can bulk up in an NFL weight room, but it's going to take time. He's a project player at this point. So there's almost no polish in any aspect of his game. Um, he's a long-term project and I'm, I, I'm excited to see where he lands. I think you're not going to get much out of him in year one or two, but I do think there's the potential for him down the road. And it is worth mentioning that. I mean, if you're going to bet on a guy, it's probably pretty smart to bet on a guy who went to West point. Like he, he seems <laughs> like he's probably, Probably a pretty hard worker. Probably a guy who uh, is going to deal with adversity well. Uh, but besides all that, I, it's this is literally a guy who the U.S. government went out of their way and like acted quickly to change the bill to allow this guy, specifically one person, to go to the NFL. They changed like a long-standing rule about uh, a certain amount of service time being needed before coming to the NFL because they wanted to help out Andre Carter's family because they thought he was going to be a first round pick. <laughs> like that was kind of baked into like, they were, it's pretty crazy, but they were like sitting on Congress being like, well, sir, he's, he's might be a top five edge rusher in this class. And he like, think about how insane that is. But um, yeah, I just thought that that was, that was worth mentioning. Cause that was a big story a, a couple months ago. Like, was he going to be allowed to be in the draft or not? Then he was, and ever since then, it's been nothing but negative news uh, for Andre Carter and the draft process. And it's just has not been kind. Uh, I'd be very surprised to see if he went on day two at this point. Yeah. All right. Dives, did you have anybody honorable mention that you wanted to give a shout out to? Um, yeah. Let's talk about Haba Baldonado out of Pittsburgh. Uh, plus size, six foot five, 260 pounds. Had a breakout year in 2021. Uh, topping the ACC with 48 total pressures and 23 quarterback hurries. Um, he didn't have the 2022 season that uh, many of us expected. He had 21 total pressures last year, 14 quarterback hurries, uh, hit opposing quarterbacks just six times with a 15.3% win rate. Um, the, but the sack production was way down. Uh, this guy's a native of Italy. Uh, he, has, uh, he plays with a lot of power. As a pass rusher, um, I think he can, you know, uh, set contain on the outside, and he's got really good athleticism and versatility. I have got a day two grade on Haba Baldonado, um, and if you want to try and spell that first name, good luck because that is brutal. Yeah, no chance, no chance. Uh, no. Uh, the guy I want to give a shout out to is Byron Young out of Tennessee. Uh, Mostly because I think he's got a cool story. Uh, I've got him as a day three prospect, but he wasn't recruited at all out of high school. And so he went to work at Dollar General and he was an assistant manager at Dollar General before he walked on at Georgia Military College. Uh, he played in 2019, but then in 2020, the school's football season was canceled because of COVID, but the team still practiced. And the coaches would like cut up highlight videos of practice and put them out on because they're trying to get these guys recruited away from the JUCO and uh, some of his highlights went viral and he drew offers as the number 10 Juco prospect and he committed to Tennessee at 6'2", 250 pounds. He's old. He's 25. Uh, he ran a 4'4", 340, which is 98th percentile. He has a 9.0 relative athletic score. 
He had 12 tackles for loss, seven sacks, and 42 pressures in 2022 in the SEC. Uh, he has outstanding flexibility and athleticism. He can change directions well. He bends well around the edges, and he's got a high motor. Like He competes hard in the running game. At, on the flip side, his weaknesses, he's slow off the ball at times, and he leads with a false step, and a lot of it, that mitigates a lot of his quickness and athleticism. He's got to refine that technique. Uh, he's got a poor rush plan and hand usage, and it feels like to me that his lower body and his upper body aren't synced up. It causes problems in his rushing moves. Uh, he's not really very good at anchoring against the run. I think he's a project guy, which isn't ideal for a guy that's 25 years old, going to be 25 on draft night. Uh, but I think he kind of profiles as a 3-4 rushing outside linebacker, edge rusher. Uh, he's going to come and he's going to work and he's got the athleticism. And so if you can refine that technique, he could be an intriguing guy uh, on day three for a team that runs a 3-4 and wants a pass rusher. So that's Byron Young. Cool story, cool, cool background. Unfortunately, it does mean uh, he comes into the league at a little bit of an advanced age. All right. Well, I think that is going to wrap it up here for our top 10 edge rushers. If you're still listening, 71 minutes into the show, bless you. You must really <laughs> like this show. So any five-star ratings and reviews wherever you're listening would really help us out. Smash that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our shows. We'll get you guys prepared. Everything you need to know leading up to the NFL draft. Uh, we will be back later this week with an Eagles dueling mock draft where each of us are going to do a mock draft for the Eagles and we're going to throw up the results on Twitter and allow you guys to choose the best mock drafter. And then, of course, we'll be back next week for another positional ranking. And so until next time, you guys keep it tuned right here to BGN Radio. Go Birds!